All right, happy Halloween. Welcome to the Lovecraft e-zine. Oh, happy Halloween. Maybe I got skipped out first. Maybe the, I don't know. People work first, people work. But anyway, happy Halloween. This is October the 31st, 2015. We do a Halloween show every year. Uh, Jeff and Scott Thomas usually join me as well. Uh, so hopefully they're on their way. But uh, we'll, we'll wait for them until... Well, uh, I'm sure they'll show up. Anyway, um, all right, so what I'd like to talk about tonight are several things. I'd like to do, for us to do some Halloween, some some readings from some of your favorite Halloween books or books that fit this, this mood, this setting. Uh, let me put Joe on the screen here because he's more interesting than what he's holding up than me. Um, that's the first thing. I would also like for us to talk about perhaps your, your favorite Halloween memory, if you have one. Pete and Matt gave me, respectively, um, October Dreams 1 and October Dreams 2. Um, and one of the cool things they do in here, besides the stories, is some of the authors talk about their favorite Halloween memory. So that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about maybe is our favorite uh, Halloween movies. Uh, we can get into our favorite Halloween books, audio dramas, whatever. Um, let's see how it goes. So let me start with this, though. Joe, right before we went on air, you were talking about you just saw the movie Trick or Treat. What did you think? Yeah, we, we had Halloween movies playing all day, literally. And we topped it off with... Uh, um, Trick or Treat, which I loved. I thought it was utterly charming. I thought the use of tropes was wonderfully done. Uh, Sam is such an adorable character. Um, I'm just blown away by Sam. I, I think that's an amazing visual. Um, uh, it just was charming. It was funny. It uh, was eerie. Um, like I said, it made excellent use of the tropes. Uh, I, I know that they are desperately trying to make a, a number two. Um, I think I'm pretty confused about what movie you're talking about. Isn't there another trick-or-treat movie that's spooky? Well, this is this is the one. I forget the director's name. Um, it has Michael the character Howard. Sam, who's like a little child in a, a a fluffy, furry orange outfit with a pumpkin yeah. head. Well, there's several interconnected stories. Yeah, inter yeah. We have you know children on a bus. Um, you know, we have the uh, werewolf. Hang on one second, the, Matt. Can you, can you mute if you're browsing? Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, go ahead, Joe. We have the little werewolf girl, drunken orgy, uh, which is nice. Um, just, I, I, I thought the interconnected stories were done well. Um, uh, I, I, I love the opening. I, I love this, you know, keep your pumpkins burning. I thought that was utterly charming. Um, the serial killer was... That just gave me so many chuckles. Uh, visually, yeah. it's well it well done. The movie held my interest. You, you know, I mean, I'm so damn jaded um, about the overuse of these tropes. And yet, not once did did it bother me in the context of this film? I just thought, you know, whatever the guy's name is that directed the film, uh, he got it right. Yeah. He, he found a way to use tropes that are so tired, it's pathetic, and, and play to their strengths instead of bore people like me with their weaknesses. Right. The, um, the director is Michael Dougherty, who is releasing Krampus next month. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the name, right? Right. 
Well, Pete, you must be well versed. You must know this film well. Yeah, I like this film. This this film is a charming little gem that yeah. sat on somebody's shelf for apparently several years before it was released. Um, and, and that's a shame. And I don't think it was ever in theaters. Um, just a, a, it's a little monstrous gem. Yeah, really, it's and never and in the theaters. Thing I did not realize that. This film doesn't even have like cult status. I, I mean, what does it have like cult junior status, or maybe or something, baby cult status, and that's very unfortunate. Right. Um, I, I agree with Pete that this is a little a little gem. Yeah, I, it had a limited theatrical release. You know, but but, but here's Pete, who's who's a big horror film fan, and he adores it. And here's Joe, who, you know, we, we know that Joe doesn't really like a lot of uh, modern horror. Um, and even even when we have a little splatter and gore in this film, I found that appealing. It worked. Um, I mean, here's somebody who really cared about it and got it right. It, it's got lovely camera work. It's got interesting characters. Um... Well, hey, well, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, on this topic, what what is maybe one or at most two movies, uh, this question is for all of you guys, that like Trick or Treat, that really embody the Halloween spirit really well done? Uh, we were talking about, before we went on air, we were talking about The well, Pro a little while ago. Yeah, go and, ahead, and as, much, as, as much as it's maligned, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. I like that, too. I agree with you on that. Yeah. You know what? It has nothing to do with the other Halloween movies. Right. You know, I don't even know if I've seen that one. I, I have not. That's about a... Uh, cr uh, a uh, owner of a mask company who is plotting to kill all the children on Halloween by sabotaging his mask. Hmm. And what makes it a good movie? Uh, just the mood, the plot, atmosphere. Well, you have, you know, I've seen some awful movies that had great, great, great plot, but you know, horrible atmosphere. Um, yeah. So you you have to put everything together. Um, the other thing I'll mention is Pumpkinhead. Yeah, Pumpkinhead's charming. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's it's a little different. I'm, I think I mentioned this last time. I just remember, I was in kindergarten and my dad took me and my two brothers to a creature feature movie um, it was in October it may have been on Halloween they showed the classic Dracula um, Frankenstein and the Wolfman mm -hmm. and so for Halloween movies those classic Universal Studios monster movies are the ones that I think of the most. But Joe mentioned sort of what it is, the one movie, if you want to get that all in one shot, Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. Yeah. Which it's is now, a great I, I like that movie. good horror movie. It's, it's not the same, it, it, it doesn't have the same, I, I, I like watching all those old Universal monster movies, but it doesn't evoke the Halloween spirit for me the same way. No, but it's a movie that works on multiple levels. And yes, the comedy, you know, we, we got a couple of classic scenes. Um, but Lugosi, I, I would argue that that may be Lugosi's best role. That may be his, his best Dracula. Um, well, was, he, technically, he only did it twice, but I would, so we would have to say well, it's better than the original right. performance. Um, he had enhanced special effects, though, in the in, in, yeah. in Stella movie. Now, now, for the kids, well, you know, the, the latest one that I think, you know, is uh, Hotel Transylvania. It was really fun for, for oh, children. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, um, I, I go, I flash back to, and we watch it like once a month here, Mad Monster Party. Mm. The Rankin-Bass uh, puppet. A stop animation film. It was Boris Karloff. Right. Oh, yeah, which is great. One of the things we 
that we did here is we have one of these like 10 disc um, monster movie box sets mm -hmm. that we bought for like 10 bucks. And oh, yeah. these things are like half of them are taken off a of TV and you, you get static. The, the quality is horrible. Uh, and we put some of these on in the dark. You know, with our couple of pumpkins lit and whatnot. And these are like watching these in 1961 on <laughs> an old black and white TV with, with reception that's not too great. And I, you know, just charming. Um, uh, I, a, a couple of these things I had never heard of, you know, like some Polish. Uh, vampire movie but it was dubbed into English uh, with I don't know uh, Cyrillic subtitles which I thought was hilarious uh, you know it's a in, in the end and who I assume they were Polish voiceover actors doing the English but you know you these are supposed to be and it's supposed to look like it's London or something um, and the actors all sound like they're from Transylvania. <laughs> it was it, it was hilarious and a bit eerie in a way. Um, but that was fun. It, it's like I mean, we bought this box set as a joke. You know, it's like wow. You know, this has got like eighty old horror movies in here, and you only heard of like five of them. The rest of them you never heard of, you know, you know. What about you, Salome? You got a favorite Halloween movie? Well, I've been racking my brain since you said that. Uh, I'm gonna say Corpse Bride, the Tim Tim Burton oh, mm -hmm. movie. Oh yeah. Because it's quite cute, and the ones that are really scary and where there's lots of murdering and stuff, I just can't <laughs> handle them. So. Corpse Bride, uh, the Blair Witch Project, I was able to watch that because there was nothing, I mean, all the scary aspects were just like, you didn't know what the hell was going on, you know, there was no actual, no one was, you never saw anything happen to anyone, but it's still. Yeah, but I might argue that makes it scarier. Yeah, but I mean. Some of us. The camera doesn't stop doing this. Yeah, that's true. That drives me out of my skull. Um, Leah is watching live, and she, yes, we are all, we all do have the light on. So, yeah, that Halloween movie. Jeff, what's your favorite Halloween movie? Uh, I don't, I don't know that I have a favorite, but right. if, if I were to have enough time to sit down and enjoy. A movie or two on Halloween. Maybe the original Evil Dead would be one of my top choices. Um, the Thing, you know, the the John Carpenter's Thing, The Exorcist, you know, kind of obvious choices. Um, <clears throat> uh, maybe um, Vincent Price, The Last Man on Earth, is a is a favorite of mine from when I was a kid. I know it's kind of cheesy, but when I was a kid, that was extremely creepy to me. Yeah, that's a good film. It's yeah. more faithful than the later version. Yes, yeah, than than yeah. than the other two. Yeah. yeah. Right, maybe we so. should have how maybe we should have another Halloween tomorrow night because now that I'm thinking <laughs> about it, I would love to do it. And because Jeff just reminded me, a, a double feature Doctor Fives would be incredible. Oh. Yeah. 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 Man. By the way, there is a new. If, there's some kind of cool new internet service called Rabbit. Where we wouldn't be able to broadcast, but let's say you want to watch whatever you want to watch a movie with friends, but you know, like now we're all in different parts of the of the world. You can use the service and you can all be watching it at the same time, chatting with mm -hmm. each other. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, so, I've done that with, with with chat groups where we've all started our DVDs at the same time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. This is an improved version of that, basically. Yeah. I thought it was a cool idea. Yeah. Right, so we're going to also read some 
selections from favorite Halloween works. Um, here's one of mine. This is by Stuart Onan. Uh, oh, yeah. It's a book called The Night Country. Have any of you guys read it? Yeah. Yeah, Onan is a great writer. Yeah, uh, I'll read a little bit of The Flap to begin with. At midnight on Halloween in a cloistered New England suburb, a car carrying five teenagers leaves a winding road and slams into a tree, killing three of them. Uh, a year later, summoned by the memories of those closest to them, the three who died come back on a last chilling mission among the living. A uh, strange and unsettling ghost story in the tradition of Ray Bradbury. So, my selection, I would like to read a couple of the, the first couple of pages, because this is what really grabbed me when I found this book in the library a few, few uh, years ago. Uh, the title of the first chapter is Something Wicked. So again, this is The Night Country by Stuart O'Nan. I highly recommend it. Uh, and here we go. Come, do you hear it? The wind murmuring in the eaves, scouring the bare trees. How it howls, almost musical, a harmony of old moans. The house seems to breathe an invalid. Leave your scary movie marathon. This is better than TV. Leave the lights out. The blue, bl the blue glow follows you down the hall. Go to the window in the unused room, the cold seeping through the, gra the glass. The moon is risen, caught in nodding branches. The image holds you, black trunks, backlit. One silver ray falling across the deck, beckoning. It's a romance, this invitation to lun lunacy, elemental yet forbidden, tempting, something remembered in the blood. Don't you ever remember? Don't you want to know? Come then, come with us, out into the night. Come now, America the lovesick, America the timid, the blessed, the educated. Come stalk the dark back roads and stand outside the bright houses, calm as murderers in the yard quiet as deer. Come, you slumberers, you lumps, arise from your legion of sleep and fly over the wild woods. Come, all you dreamers, all you zombies, all you monsters. What are you doing anyway? Paying the bills, washing the dishes, waiting for the doorbell? Come on, take your keys, leave the bowl of candy on the porch, put on the suffocating mask of someone else and breathe. Be someone you don't love so much for once. Listen, like the children, we only have one night. Um, it's a great book. Mm. Very atmospheric uh, ghost story. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to whoever wants to read next, and then maybe we'll talk about favorite Halloween memories or whatever else comes up. So who wants to go next, Pete? Uh, well, let me turn on the light because I can't read in the dark. Apparently. All right. All right. Here we go. I don't know why I picked this, but this is um, "Memory of the Night," which came out I think last year in the Cthulhu Mythos sampler. For the first time in a year, I creep up out of the hot earth that bask in the cool night wind and stare at the moon and the stars as they crawl through distant abstract orbits. Once I would have made my own tunnel, but in this place, men have dug great pits where before only natural rents had led to the mineral wealth they had so much desired. There was a town here, but through the years it has slowly vanished. The humans come during the day with their machines and pull the buildings down eager to remove what evidence they can, desperate to make the place vanish into the dustbins of time. All that remains above ground are a few buildings, some pipes, the crumbling roads, and the cemetery. Below the surface, in the abandoned mines, there is a fire that burns the earth itself. Men cannot extinguish that. They have tried, but to no avail. Not all the coal seams are on fire, but those that are have smoldered for years, sending wispy smoke and the stink of sulfur into the landscape above. There's nothing here to see, and no one to see it, a little more than a memory, except to me. For while men have abandoned the place, tried to wipe it off the map, 
I have come to call it home. Men are like that. Men have always been like that. They build things, monuments, towns, villages, cemeteries, cities. And when they fail, when they go wrong, when the construct turns sour, they walk away. Men refuse to live in such places. They cannot abide them, cannot even suffer to sleep in them. Men cannot stand the sight of their own failure. Pummel things in dust if they must. There are places that resist destruction, and such places are useless to men, and yet they refuse to relinquish them completely. Such strange attitudes men have. They look on these places with contempt, with uneasy memories, with hopelessness. These places have failed them, but they will not let them go. Monsters find homes in such places. We thrive in them. We cultivate our crops and our families amongst the dead and decay and diseased, but always in secret. For men never truly abandon anything, and they are jealous of those who can thrive where they cannot. The cemetery between the villages of Innsmouth and Arkham, one of many men built, used and then abandoned, is so old that the places have nearly been forgotten. We built the vast tunnels linking the moldering crypts and tombs. We established businesses and temples. We had culture in our own way, music and dance, theater and art. We built a refuge for those things of the night that still existed, and the monstrous things that men made and discarded when they proved to be something other than men. We had laws, codes of behavior, and we enforced them. We called it home. And we knew someday it all had to end. The oracles of Dela, the three white sisters, had issued forth their dire prophecies, and the artists had added to their mural. We knew some of what would happen. One of the Volusians would be involved. Meetings were called. Debate was held. Motions were made and laws were passed, laws made in an attempt to avoid the inevitable, which only served to frustrate those of Elusia. They left us, migrated away. Only Stack remained. He scoffed at the prophecy and at the laws. He stayed to provide the, He stayed to prove the prophecies false, which made the prophecies self-fulfilling. Outsiders came and were accepted. Men came looking for them and then more followed with fire and guns. The necropolis fell. I remember it. This is my task, my curse, to remember what is important. But in the quarter century that has passed since, it has remained only a memory. I have not committed it to the page. I haven't yet judged it worthy of being part of our history, the history of the people who are not men. I've read the books that Carter wrote, but they are more romance and adventure, more hyperbolic fiction and historical fact. I've heard the music as well, the story that lurks behind pitiful lyrics and cacophonous noise played on the radio. Those beats hold a secret message for we who know the drumming language that once echoed through the barrow halls. The story has been told, shared, compiled, exaggerated, translated, and repeated in a dozen of the ancient ways we have learned to speak to one another. I can trace a dozen or more authors through the telling. I've heard or read or seen. Simon has written a monologue. Pickman has a diptych in the gallery in Soho. Jeffrey has composed an opera, Kadath. There are murals in the subways of Philadelphia that I think are the work of Lavinia, or perhaps one of her children. We have found ways to survive, places to hide and thrive. Some of us have talents that can be useful to men, skills that can be marketed. There is no market for what I do. No one wants to read the history of monsters. Not the true history, not really except for other monsters. There are so few of us, and we are scattered. We live in fear of being found again. But when we are lonely, we cry out for each other as best we can. Mine is a lonely, loathsome task, as is that of my children. The wind comes up out of the valley, carrying with it the rasping sound of one of my brood, singing the title of this year's work, the scream of a Shagoth. I smile, a short work, but he is still young. Another, an older sibling, echoes back his own accomplishment, asking the song. The first child responds by passing along the work of a more distant member of my own brood. I'm shocked by the title. And honestly, I do not know how he came to know about the subject matter. I'm not sure I want to know. But someday, I'm sure I shall want to read The Second Life of Dr. West. I let the wind play over my body before inhaling and swelling my lungs up to twice their normal size. A long seam along the back of my carapace cracks. 
isn't much, three inches at most, but it's a start. I exhale, and then straining, I try to push air into my lungs. My chest aches as I force the carapace apart. I can feel the seam break length lengthen, and one of my new wings squeezes out and slowly unfurls. The other wing follows suit. They are sad, tiny things. I stretch them out, exercising them against the breeze. When I'm sure I have control, I reach down, and with the claws on the wingtips, I grab both sides of my carapace and spread it apart. There's a sucking sound as I work my way up and out of my dead shell. It's thin, like rice paper. I could easily tear through it if I wanted to, but I spent too long on this particular piece to destroy it. It takes me hours to peel the dry, rigid carapace off. It is a macabre strip tease, where as I take off each panel, the flesh beneath is not yet dry. And to the untrained eye, what appears nothing more than raw, flayed muscle, moist and glistening. The new flesh swells I move from limb to limb. It's a dangerous time for me. I am exposed, vulnerable, and unshielded from the elements. Even after I remove all the old shell, it still takes time for the new flesh to harden. I have to remain in place for hours. Only then can I be sure that my new carapace is sufficiently strong enough to carry my weight. It should be a tedious and frightening time, but at the moment I have no desire to watch for intruders. <clears throat> With slow, careful movements, I gather up my old skin and wings, and in the moonlight I read what is written on the inside. For years my subconscious has worked on my flesh, inscribing words in blood, invisible to my own eyes. Only now... With my annual metamorphosis, can I and my children read what we have written? We are books that can be only read when we are open, books of flesh and blood. When we are finally privileged to read what we have created, what our minds have secreted within our, without our conscious participation, we revel in them. <coughs> As my new body dries, I read. It takes me hours, but I have the time. The story is familiar. The character, the actor is well known. And I know this tale. I've heard it before, but the details are slightly different. The, hyper, the hyperbole and the exaggerations eliminated. The facts dry, untinged by romanticism or heroics. It is a masterpiece of historical narrative, comparable to anything Turco or Ellis has written. Were the subject matter not so monstrous, if the author himself not a monster, it would surely be contender for the Pulitzer Prize. Instead, I do the only thing I can do. I raise my wings and I bend them together, finding the serrations that allow me to stridulate, to chirrup, to sing. It takes me a moment to tune the newly dried ridges, but only a moment. I fill the air around me with vibrations that quickly form a chorus, and then are carried forth in the wind. It is a simple two-word phrase, nothing more. But it is, as we have always done, as my children have always done, I announce the title and nothing more. The night pauses. My children grow quiet. I strain to hear them. But for hundreds of miles, there is nothing but silence. It goes on and on for far too long. The time creeps by. And in the few moments that pass, I grow despondent. Perhaps my title is too bold. My subject matter too daring. I may be the patriarch of this brood of Alazif. But I am not infallible. If I show weakness, if I produce inferior work, I can be overthrown, deposed, replaced eaten. I could be executed for poor scholarship. The world erupts in a cacophony of sound. My children are screaming. The sound drives me from my feet, forcing me to the ground. I scream back, and they stop their maddening calls. They replace them with whispers, murmuring pleas, pleading requests. They are begging me to talk, to read, to recite from my work. They want to hear it as much as they can before the dawn forces us back underground. I rise up and refine my instrument. I send forth a crescendo to silence the whisperers, and then I begin. It will take hours to transmit the entire piece. And if I rush in a few passages, leave out some footnotes, some minor movements, I may finish it before dawn. As always, I begin with a title sequence before moving into the body of the work, the tale of Olmsted and Asnath, of Ahab and Obed, of the death of Wait and of Gilman. The overture ends, and the prologue begins. And by its content and composition, I either flourish or die. This is the way it has always been, and always shall be. Here, then, is my masterpiece. Innsmouth Lost, Arkham Unbound.
did that? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that was awesome, Keith. So, yeah, it's, it's really all about mood and, and, and imaging, imagery, but I really wanted to talk about, you know, the, the idea of, of the cicada coming out of its shell and the interior being actual text. I always yeah. like to hear from an alien viewpoint, you know, to get inside a non-human entity and yeah. have them express themselves from a first person where you're really, uh, that's, that's, that's tricky to pull off, very tricky. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Pete. Before we go on to the next reading, uh, to break it up a bit, I thought it would be neat to, to talk about your favorite Halloween memory. So, anyone thought about that? Well, it, it's it's hard to say because it's um. I hate to say it, but now it's so long ago. <laughs> you know, it, it, some of these have sort of blurred together, but. When I was a boy in Columbus, Ohio, it was the last time I felt like I was a neighborhood kid. I was part of the neighborhood, so every house we knew to, we, we went to, we knew someone from school, or um, they knew us, or uh, we knew their cousins or something. This was blocks and blocks around my house. I'd, we were just kind of ensconced there. And I just remember one Halloween, I might have been fourth grade, fifth grade, something like that, just going from neighbor's house to neighbor's house, and there would be things like um, they would have bowls of uh, apple cider, and you'd serve yourself a little Dixie cup of apple cider, or they'd have like a can uh, table with candles on it, and you'd have cinnamon donuts, little cinnamon donuts, or mm. um, uh, they would give out popcorn balls and candied apples, and Things you never see today, yeah. and and considering the neighborhoods that we've lived in, bringing up our boys and how long, how much time has passed, the swarms of kids going around the neighborhood, all no parents, you know, it was just just the kids like you might see in in some of those uh, wallpapers people put up, you know, like. Two or three or four friends or brothers and sisters in costumes with a, of course, with a plastic pumpkin, not a big bag or anything, and uh, collecting money for UNICEF at the same time. Remember those boxes? Yeah. I, I, that that's kind of what I remember. Everyone, no one had fancy lights or decorations. Everyone had a a pumpkin that they lit up, and uh. It was Ohio, so there was a bite of cold in the air. The uh, leaves were past their peak and starting to fall. I mean, that, that, that's, um, that was my favorite memory. Mm. Who would like to read a passage next? Well, I have a ghost poem by Robert E. Howard I looked up. All right. It, it's, um, of course, i got to turn on my light. It's, uh, of course, it's Robert E. Howard, you know, so um, even though it's a ghost poem, he can't, uh, he, he can't, um, uh, he can't escape making it an action poem. <laughs> if you know what I mean? It's like, it's just, it's not in his nature to do something like that. So this is... I think this is actually a – for those who know – Robert E. Howard, I love reading his poetry. It, it, it's, um, it's all it, – it's got movement you know, and imagery. Uh, this one be, might be one of his better-known ones. It's called Dead Man's Hate. And sorry, I'm not Morgan Scorpion. I wish, you know, I wish I had her dramatic flair. Hmm. They hanged John Farrell in the dawn amid the marketplace. At dusk came Adam Brand to him and spat upon his face. Ho, neighbors all, spake Adam Brand. See John Farrell's fate. Tis proven here a hempen noose is stronger than a man's hate. For heard ye not John Farrell's vow to be avenged on me? Come life or death, see how he hangs high on the gallows tree. Yet never a word the people spake in fear and wild surprise. 
for the grisly corpse raised up its head and stared with sightless eyes, and with strange motions, slow and stiff, pointed at Adam Brand and clambered down the gibbet tree, the noose within its hand. With gaping mouth stood Adam Brand like a statue carved of stone, till the dead man's hand laid a clammy hand hard on his shoulder bone. Then Adam shrieked like a soul in hell, the red blood left his face, and he reeled away in a drunken run through the screaming marketplace, and close behind the dead man came with a face like a mummy's mask, and the dead joints cracked and the stiff legs creaked with their unwanted task. Men fled before the flying twain or shrank with bated breath, and they saw on the face of Adam Brand the seal set there by death. He reeled on buckling legs that failed, and yet on and on he fled. So through the shuddering marketplace, the dying fled the dead. At the riverside fell Adam Brand with a scream that rent the skies. Across him fell John Farrell's corpse, while ever the twain did rise. There was no wound on Adam Brand, but his brow was cold and damp, for the fear of death had blown out his life as a witch blows out a lamp. His lips were writhed in a horrid grin like a fiend's on Satan's coals, and the men that looked on his face that day, <coughs> his stare still haunts their souls. For such was the doom of Adam Brand, a strange unearthly fate. For stronger than death or hemp and noose are the fires of a dead man's hate. Cool. <coughs> I should mention that my wife and son and I just came from a little tour, Halloween tour here downtown. Uh, you guys know I live in a small downtown in a small town, but it's a, it's a really cool downtown for anyone who doesn't know. And, uh, we live in a loft uh, on the second floor. And so they did a little tour of, of a couple of the buildings, uh, and it was, it was a pretty interesting Halloween tour. So, love to see more of those buildings. What was the nature of the tour, Mike? Did they was there ghost stories involved, or history mm -hmm. of the buildings, or? It was it was basically no, there were no ghost stories. It was the history of the that particular building mm -hmm. uh, where they were. Uh, I guess yeah, she told a couple of she said a couple of things like you know people have heard this or that or the other. I was mainly there for the tour of the building. A lot of interesting buildings down here. So, but she definitely set the mood. Lots of Halloween candles and and things like that. So, hey Scott, I don't know if you can hear us or not. He's having trouble here. Um, who would like to read next? Joe, you got something? No breeze. Joe went away. Yeah. Oh, did he? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read next. Let me put the light on. Yeah. Joe was frozen on my screen, so I thought he was still there. What are you going to read from? I am going to read from The Dark Star by Robert W. Chambers. All right. Because we often mention Joe and I that we've read a lot of his lesser works, but there's a passage in some of these books that just blows you away. Why the whole work might not be the yellow sign. This paragraph is the chambers at his best. Yeah, absolutely. You're reading you're reading a chambers book that's terrible. And all of a sudden for three hundred words it's like this is as good as he ever wrote. Um, occasionally he forgets, you know, and writes like Robert W. Chambers. <laughs> All right, so this is from the Dark Star. I am Ehrlich, ruler of chaos and all that was. The old order passes when I arrive. I bring confusion among the peoples. I hurl down emperors. Kingdoms crumble where I pass. The world begins to rock and tip. Spitting, spilling nations into outer darkness, where there are no more kingdoms and no more kings, no more empires and no emperors, 
And when only the humble till, the blameless sow, the pure reap, when only the teachers teach in the shadow of the tree, and when the thinker sits unstirring under the high stars, then from the dark agent edges of the world, I let go my grasp and drop into those immeasurable d d depths from which I came. I, Ehrlich, ruler of all that was. So that's it. Yeah, there's some real nice stuff in Dark Star. <clears throat> Who wants to read next? I'll read. All right. I'm not work safe though. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna be Livia Llewellyn this evening. <laughs> Are well, you we work Glancy, safe? Glancy was on last week and he wasn't work safe, so I'll be like that. Um, there's this guy out there in the world. And we don't want to name any names and, you know, start any flame wars. But he's a little off his rocker. And he decided he wants to do this book called Autumn Cthulhu. <laughs> and so he solicited some writers, a lot of really great writers. And apparently I've snuck into this book. So, to promote this book, which I believe there's like a Kickstarter coming in a couple of weeks. Yeah, maybe less. I'm okay. I'm well, about I don't three quarters have, of the way through it. I don't have those specific details, but I thought to maybe promote this book, which is going to have people like I don't know John Langan and Laird Barron and S. P. Miskowski and. Damien, Angelica Walters, you know, people like that. Pete Rollick, I think he's in this book. Yeah, somebody, Pete Rollick, whoever that is, I've never heard of the guy, but he, I think he's got a story in this book. So I'm going to read the first section of my story, which it's not atmospheric, but it takes place on Halloween, and it's called Trick or the other thing. Fuck the asshole kids. Jesus. Go to London's or Steve Raiders. They had their lamps trimmed and burning and their pumpkins carved in grinning jack lanterns. lanterns. They're on display. And the carpenter's lawn, windows, garage door, and front porch were fucking Halloween land. Green and orange lights, most flashing or winking, illuminated their driveway. And there was a smoke machine in the manicured rose bushes on the right side of their steps. They had rubberish bats, some with blinking red eyes, and old sheets for ghosts, and a seven-foot plastic glow-in-the-dark skeleton hanging from the maple tree in the center of their yard. Shit, they encouraged the kids to lie down in front of, in front of any of the six large styrofoam rest-in-peace tombstones and take goddamn pictures. And they had their all-weather patio speakers in the bushes by the smoke machine, looping a self-burned CD of seasonal standards that included Monster Mash and Thriller and Ghostbusters, interlaced with cartoonish screams and howling monsters. Go to fuck across the goddamn street. Bell, bell, bell. Trick-or-treat, trick-or-treat, trick-or-treat. Trick or treat from a mouth of fire. Trick or treat. Trick or treat. Trick or treat. Bag out and open. Bell. Bell. Trick or treat. Me too. Trick or treat. Atticus could half recall some poem he had read in high school English about Halloween and birds. Yeah, pests and harpies. All they do is laugh and beg and stare. I'd like to show them the tune's black maw. Trick or treat. Treat, please. Hi. Trick. No, no, treat. I meant treat. Treat, please. Trick or treat. Trick or treat. Unhappy eyes. Treat, please. Bell, bell. Lightning laughter on the other side of the door. Bell. Trick or treat. Grimacing when nothing is offered. Trick or treat. Nervous. Trick. Treat. No. Thank you. No candy. No reason to. 
Bell, extended, Bell, 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 goddamn little fuckers, fuck the thigh-high princess and her goddamn soccer mom, fuck Pokemon, fuck the peacock with the giant slippers that was going to tumble on someone's front steps and break their face, and the Power Rangers and Super Mario and the stupid cookie monster or whatever the fuck that was, and fuck Pooh. And fuck Walmart Wolverine and that stupid-ass tie-dyed ghost that reaped the weed. High school assholes should be at the mall with the other high school assholes. His lights were off. Off. Addis Kenton had mowed the most. Two hours to get it all done. Bagged what needed to be bagged. Took three bags to the dump. Hadn't decorated. He never decorated. Fuck Christmas and double fuck Halloween. Little bastards wanted candy. Let them go get fucking jobs, or whine until their parents swatted their asses, or jam some candy down their gobs. Bell had been ringing since just before four. Group of three race ties, parents waiting at the bottom of the driveway, in cheap Walmart, Walmart, Walmart and Target costumes. Group of six high school kids, sexy pirate, two matching Star Trek sensei, Captain America, Poison Ivy, and a girl, Freddy Krueger. Atticus thought she had nice tits. <laughs> Two, one with his dad. She was some fuzzy, pink, and glitter critter, and dear old dad was a clown. Had her on a reflective leash. Four, five o'clock, six, three, one, and one more. Four groups of two less than a minute apart. Eight thirty. Go to fuck home and go to bed. Nine fucking p.m. Didn't stop. Bell, 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 nearly 11 o'clock, insistent bell again. Fuck. Atticus opened the door. Glower. Take down power, pushing the same energy that shotgun projectiles deliver at impact. Trick. Or the other thing. Christ, wasn't even a kid. Guy. Over seven feet by any measure. Old, old guy. Goddamn senior by the look. from the coffin black that lies between the stars. And the asshole was wearing bright red pharaoh robes. And that I, I don't Halloween, no candy. And if I did, it would be for kids. Slam the door, turn the deadbolt, bell again, over his shoulder. Fuck, I just told you. The door opened itself. The thing had been locked. Double walk. Good evening. How the fuck? The door? It's just something I can do, said with a smile. Atticus Kenton, stomach and chest burdened by the madness of a fear, held by defenseless men struck by unseen things, night stalkers hissing in the primal darkness, finished turning and stepped back at the same time. Face the wolf shaped by its desires a beast with an infernal coloring in its eye. He wished he owned a gun. His bodyguard, Cuddy, had told him 29, 20 times he needed one. He'd been in Rolling Stone more times than I can count, and he sold 15 million CDs. That draws freaks, stalkers, and a world of shit. Atticus hadn't been in a fistfight since he was in junior high school. He wondered if it came to shoving in fists what would happen. On the road, he'd always had Cuddy for this kind of shit. Mounting alerts with shrieks. Is afraid out. Quick. Thick as a non thick as nonstop desperation on a straight for elsewhere. Eyes roam the room for sudden weapons. Finds nothing. No no way to hurry away. Nothing hard to swing or cause bleed. All his agitation can is hand him his cell. You know what 9-11 summons? Leave now or you'll be in cuffs. Trooper station's less than a mile from here. I believe you'll find that device does not work. He was right. No service. I got a gun. No, you don't. And you are out of future. That is, as you'll soon discover, why I've stopped by this evening. Out of future. i Blair for months now. Longer. Rolling Stone said the same in a review two months ago. Atticus Kenton is out of touch with everything. From take me with you to colorless ground,
Kenton's blue-seared songs of pain and musing and prophecy have brilliantly explored the consciousness of the postmodern Steppenwolf as he roams from Desolation Road and Nightmare Alley. Broken heart to betrayed heart until his last dead-on arrival released three years ago, Personal Effects. My review, October 2010, called the release out of touch and directionless, devoid of the passion and hungry poetry his fans had come to expect from this former, from this farmer of the city. There's not a whiff of Kenton's on the Chicago Blues Man guitar on this Tonight I'm Crooning, Just For You, cocktail jazz, piano-based experiment of limp and thoroughly deluded. Lyrically, it yawns with many bass fragments stitched together in hollow transmissions from a mainstream power pop sensibility. It's forgotten how to tap its foot. No treat for fans. My autopsy can only declare that this train wreck killed the patient. We can only hope someone buries Kenton's remains at the crossroad. And the devil, passing by and in the mood to dole out treats from his trick bag, will pause and offer terms that inject mojo back into his shriveled soul. Last week's largely unattended concert at the Barris was further proof that the patient is dead. Kenton, the former front pretty poison frontman, stepped on the stage fronting a four-piece combo and offered up songs from the soon-to-be-released The Sorrow and the Search. Four songs in, a third of the very small audience quietly made their escape. This reviewer, it's what they pay me for, stayed. For an old fan, it was 90 minutes of heartbreak and torture. Two stars. Dead. This guy's gonna kill me. A frenzy of disease and devils erased the smile from its face. Behind the intruder, the lights directly across the street at the carpenter's house were suddenly extinguished. The whole street went black. Black, not empty. There were other phantoms in the spaces on the other side of the doorway. Things from a measureless, deeper table. Mindless things driven by must. Addicts Kenton could see, see them, see them in the dense eternal shades. And he could feel their measure. Drawing a breath, he could taste the activity and reflections of their consciousness. Ah, you sense my friends and companions. The man smiled his back. Not to worry, Atticus. They're not coming in. Yet. After that. And that's not the whole story for anyone interested. So. Oh no, that's that's hardly the beginning. Um I guess it doesn't have to be a favorite Halloween memory per se, but if somebody else wanna talk about a Halloween memory that uh, sticks in your mind. Uh, we can't hear you, Scott. Sorry. No, he's frozen. Oh, I can see his lips moving. <laughs> oh, well, he's frozen for me. Yeah, he's... Yeah, we can't hear you, buddy. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Anybody, anybody else? Or reading is fine, too. Um, well, I've got another poem I could read. This yeah. short. Um... <coughs> It, it is um, about transitioning. It's by uh, Clark Ashton Smith. I love, love, love this. Um, it is called The Sorcerer Departs. Um, I pass, but in this lone and crumbling tower, built it against the burrowing seas of chaos, my volumes and my filters shall abide. Poisons more dear than any mithridate, and spells far sweeter than the speech of love. Half shapen dooms shall slumber in my vaults, and in my volumes cryptic runes that shall 
outblast the pestilence, outgnaw the worm, when loosed by alien wizards on strange years under the blackened moon and paling sun. Just love that. Um, I talked about favorite Halloween books thank you earlier this month but what about you guys got some favorite Halloween short stories anything come to mind yeah uh, shoot the name of it just went out in my head it's a David Shao story um I'll have to think about it. Sorry. No, that's fine. Old age is a bitch. Yeah. I have fa favorite short stories, but they're not they don't necessarily pertain to Halloween, you know? They they might be spooky, creepy, whatnot, but Yeah, that's fine. Like I said, not not about Halloween or necessarily take place about you know during Halloween, you know, just uh, No, it doesn't have to. I, for example, one of my favorite novellas that kind of evokes the Halloween mood for me is uh, The Man on the Picture by Susan Hill. Yeah. But it's not set around Halloween or anything. When was that written? I'm not familiar with that, Mike. Uh, I think it was the early 80s. Hmm. Uh, the copyright on this edition is 2007. But Could you hold the cover? Yeah, I will. Maybe. I don't know. Got, uh, first published in Great Britain in 2007. So maybe I'm thinking of a different one of her books. Yeah, it's uh, The Man in the Picture by Susan Hill. Um, she's the same lady that wrote um, The Woman in Black, which was oh. recently made into a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually think this is the better book. Really a great book. Mm. Very spooky. I highly recommend it. I like a short story by Robert Block, which I'm not sure if it's exactly set during Halloween, but it's during a masquerade uh, ball. Oh, yeah. Oh, the Cloak. Oh. It's about a man who goes into a shop and buys a... Uh, but what's the dress of his Dracula and buys a cloak? And uh, if you ever seen the movie The House That Dripped Blood, uh, Block did a more adapted it in a somewhat comedic fashion. But the original story is written very seriously. And Block gets to know where the credit that he should. Mm. Not anymore. I got a poem I want to read. Yeah, go ahead. Let me get the book. This is Robin Spriggs. This is from Diary of a Gentleman Diablos. It's a real short little thing called Elegy of Rain. Rain, each drop a thousand years kissing the smooth marble of my tombstone face. Rain, etching a eulogy in my granite expression, summoning up an eternity of experience and a few brief lines. Rain, carving an epigraph in an undead mass. Rain, here. Rain, lie. Rain, I. Here lie I, standing in the rain. I love Spriggs. And if yeah, we're going to read poems, let, yeah. us, let us journey to Anne Schrader, who is our best Lovecraftian poet in my estimation. Um, head and shoulders above just about anybody else working. Yes, I'm sure that'll upset people, but. And this is my favorite poem by her. And she. Lyric. 
rolled in that dark dirt, river polished and numb as pebbles. Death te teaches us first to forget, and then to forget forgetting. Lean fingers of trees reach down for minnows, but cannot snare us. The maggots come as messengers of peace. The worms like wingless angels. I just yeah, think that's all in Autumn Cthulhu also. Oh. Yeah, she's she's incredible. <clears throat> she is. I'm not sure how much of a good recording this is going to make with podcasts because I keep seeing that it, it, Google Hangouts having a being really moody tonight for whatever reason. So it, it, it it's apparently kicking viewers off for a couple minutes and then it comes back. For different people, so I don't know. I'll have to look at the recording later and see if it is. Oh, damn. Can you folks hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Scott. hey, we can hear you, Scott. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. Freaking technology. You went out trick or treating? Yes, we did. It was really cool. Yeah, some folks really. There's this one house that every year they just, these people, it's such a labor of love. There was this, I don't know, like a guy, he made this eight foot creepy clown costume and they do a theme each year. It was this spooky clowns. It's, it, it's hard to describe uh, all the different stuff they do. And it's, it's not like cheesy either. They do a really nice, uh, put on a nice show for everybody. Yeah. Um. Well, since we got you, you got a memorable Halloween that you'd like to share? Favorite Halloween memory, anything like that? There are so many that uh, I, I was trying to uh, remember one that was would be really outstanding because there's been so many through the different uh, phases of my life and, and different circumstances, different ages, the different impressions, so many different Halloween uh, memories that are, are wonderful. I, one I thought was really cool, and it was in, when I was in, oh my god, it was in my, there's, there's, there's two that come to mind, actually. There's, there's one I was in my 30s, and I was living on this street, Cottage, Cottage Street in Westboro, Mass, my hometown. And uh, <laughs> I decided to go out and just skulk around and be creepy outside. So I, I put on this mask. I had, it had this black hood of, of like felt and this rubber monster face with fangs that kind of came out in a dog-like way, but it was green. And I had a, I believe I had a, a, a cloak on that we bought for one of our movies. And I had made a spear by taking a, like a broom handle, spray painting it black. And I took a, a pine so a pie serving spatula type unit and made a spear. So I went walking around my hometown with this spear just out amongst the trick-or-treaters and I went downtown and stood outside windows and, and looked in ominously. I ran into this, this kid, this stranger. He's uh, in this uh, Freddy Krueger uh, get-up and he's, he's made a very realistic Freddy Krueger love with the blades and everything. And we, we stopped when we scared some kids and they ran into the street and one dropped this flashlight and it broke. So we, we were, well, we're getting you know, out of control here. So we chilled that up. But the other memory is, is much more aesthetic. It was uh, over the 30s and it was Halloween night after trick-or-treating. And I just wanted to go in the streets that of my town that I loved, the streets that I had uh, on as a kid. And it was a warm, kind of windy night, so it was a little too warm for Halloween, perhaps. But and I'm I'm out there. I, I used to wear this uh, long World War Two uh, army coat. It would, be, it would be great for a flasher. This long, long coat that went down to you know, my legs. I was out walking in my army coat and it was blowing in the wind and the 
the, the streets were dark and some folks had left their Halloween lights on and maybe some jack lanterns here and there. That was just so almost mystical to me. The, the leaves and the trees were shaking and blowing around me and the, the I remember the quality of the street lights uh, and, and the strange effect of the uh, the leaves uh, in, in the trees that hadn't blown down the, the way the, their color, beautiful colors were strange and muted and sort of uh, uh, unearthly in the uh, street light glow. And it's just walking these dark streets alone late at night. It, it was just uh, really, really uh, just me communing with my favorite uh, night of the year. Yeah, I know what you mean. Somehow... If it's if it's cool, if the leaves are blowing, if the if it's uh, you know if there if if it's there's there there's color and so forth, then it doesn't quite work when there isn't. Like down here in Texas, there's uh you know it can actually be still hot at Halloween. It isn't so hot this year because it's been raining a lot, but uh, actually tonight we walked outside for a while and it was. A nice Halloween had a nice Halloween feel to it, at least for Texas. But we're but going yeah. swimming tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We're going swimming tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Anybody got anything else they want to read? Oh, um, I, I, if no one else, I do have one last thing. All right, okay. Uh, this is uh. So it's the other big three of the big three. This is by Lovecraft himself. We've all seen this poem. It's called uh, Halloween in a Suburb. Uh, and it's another one that I really, I like, to, I like to read on this night pretty much every year. Uh, Halloween in a Suburb by H.P. Lovecraft. The steeples are white in the wild moonlight, and the trees have a silver glare. Past the chimneys high, see the vampires fly and the harpies of upper air that flutter and laugh and stare. For the village dead to the moon outspread, never shone in the sunset's gleam, but grew out of the deep that the dead years keep, where the rivers of madness stream, then the gulfs to a pit of dream. A chill wind weaves through the rows of sheaves and the meadows that shimmer pale, and comes to twine where the headstones shine and the ghouls of the churchyard wail for harvests that fly and fail. Not a breath of the strange gray gods of change that tore from the past its own can quicken this hour when a spectral power spreads sleep o'er the cosmic throne and looses the vast unknown. So here again stretch the veil and plain that moons long forgotten saw and the dead leap gay in the pallid ray sprung out of the tomb's black maw to shake all the world with awe. And all the mor all that morn shall greet forlorn the ugliness and the pest <coughs> of rows where thick rise the stones and brick. Some shall day be with the rest and brood the shades unblessed. Then wild in the dark let the lemurs bark and the leper's spires ascend. For the new and old alike in the fold of horror and death are penned for the time of for the hounds of time to rend. Yeah, speaking of poetry, when I first uh, saw Oh, I'm sorry, I just went out of my head that John Carpenter uh, his second movie. The Fog? Pardon me? The Fog. The Fog, yeah, thank you. When I saw that for the first time, and they opened up with a quote from an Edgar Allan Poe poem, uh, I knew it was going to be a good movie, and it was. That's a good Halloween movie, too. The remake was pretty terrible. Do you know what the poem was? Uh, yeah, it was. They, they quoted, uh, the quote was, all, all that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. So... Uh, but yeah, 1980, I believe, when that came out. That was Carpenter's second movie, wasn't it? Yeah. I th was Dark? Did he direct Dark Star? Yeah. No? Yeah. So, you know, Fog was 
necessarily. <clears throat> Dark Star? Yeah, it's a sci-fi comedy. Oh, I don't think I've seen it. It was it was very low budget, very obscure. The the fog was his second horror movie, but he may have yeah, the second mainstream movie. When 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 did he make? Didn't he make a movie about uh, assault on a precinct? Assault on, assault on precinct thirteen. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that's right too. That was before yeah. Halloween. If you get a chance to watch that, I consider that the greatest zombie movie ever made. It is like a zombie movie. It really sets the stage for a lot of the zombie movies that come later. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. <clears throat> um, you know, growing up, I can remember. I can remember a lot of my my dad was like this big Halloween guy. We would string like giant spider webs. We would spend the year collecting um, flash powder from used. Uh, the photography equipment, and then he would have little flash bangs in, in, in the yard. He wow. took it off in one year um, and showed me in it. And so anytime anybody walked up, you know, they had to open the coffin. <laughs> That's pretty and, cool. Uh, but the, the, the thing that sticks in my head the most about, you know, I talked last time about the, the body that was on the playground for, for a couple days, but the thing that sticks in my mind the most is this thing that happened not at my house, but at my grandparents' house. Um, I was walking the dog and went over to the, the park next to my grandparents' house, and you know, there's a, a baseball field that backs up to a, a marsh, a wooded area with you know wet. And um, I let the dog loose to run around, and we're just playing, and... Out of the corner of my eye, I see this guy. He's walking along the edge of, of the trees, and he's not on the sidewalk. He's he's on the edge. He's really small, like maybe five feet tall, but he's wearing a trench coat, and he's got pink washing gloves on. You know the the, the stuff you did you wash dishes with. Yeah. And and um. What we we would probably call wellies, you know, the the, the really big wet boots, <laughs> big over your, and it's it, it's just a really odd look, and he's got dark sunglasses on it, and you know, in retrospect, this is my um, Ramsey Campbell experience, right? Because this is straight out of his story, and my dog suddenly takes off after him. Oh, big German Shepherd. And um, so I'm suddenly running after him, and the dog just, you know, he starts taking off, and the dog's running after him, and I catch up with the dog, and I roll into this guy, and he's soft. <laughs> I was going to say that this is the Ramsey Campbell story, and he's soft. He's soft. And he never says a, you know, through this whole thing, he never says a word. He just, he I'm sitting there on the ground holding the dog, and I'm just stunned. And he, he just runs off. Not, uh, how old were you? I was probably, you know, the dog, probably about 16, 17 years old. Yeah. Wow. And that, that, you know, and I had not read a lot of Ramsey Campbell at that point. Um, and, yeah, it just sort of sticks in my head. That's weird. It is, it is, you know, it just... Did you get a look at his face? No, no. Was, was his head like stuck on an insect's body? <laughs> <laughs> did you, or did did you wake up that fish? night and he was standing at the end of the bed staring oh, at you? Thanks. That's a whole hell of a lot. No, you know, actually, you know, if somebody had come into that house, my grandmother used to make her own bathtub vodka. And, uh, she used to slaughter her own animals and make kielbasa in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nobody messed with my grandmother. Wow. Yeah. You, you may have met I, I got a Golak from Cold Print uh, that night. Yeah. So so you grew up in Silent Hill? <laughs> Actually, mm -hmm. you know, not, I know where that town is. I know where, um, uh, what is it called, Cahokia? Mm-hmm. That's not, and actually, it's funny you mentioned that because that's a, that's the town I based that story I read earlier. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think you know. talked about the coal seams. I, I thought, you know, that's made that connection. 
Yeah. You know, I, I still have not seen Silent Hill. Is that worth watching? Yeah. The first, yeah, it's worth watching. Don't expect a lot, but it's worth yeah, watching. Yeah, I was going to say, it. I, I've seen like the first 15 minutes. And I think I got bored and turned it off. It's all about the atmosphere and the and the uh, imagery, you know. Right. It's like, just think of it as like you're you're watching a dream, a nightmare, you know. Mm -hmm. Make sense out of it. Hmm. Cool. And before I forget, Scott, don't leave um, tonight without talking to me. So. Okay, Pete. All right. <laughs> hmm. I have one scary story to tell. Yeah. Okay. But it didn't happen on Halloween. But it was okay. just. Uh, I used to date someone who lived in a house where a lot of strange things happened. The strangest thing that ever happened in the house was one night when I I called him and he wasn't home and I left a message on his voicemail saying I'm going to come over later. Then I drove to his house. He lived like a 35-minute drive away from me. So I went there. He had a big chocolate lab. And he wasn't home. I had a key. I let myself in. I was just hanging out with the dog, waiting for him to get back. I had no idea where he was. It wasn't dark yet when I got there. Uh, and then suddenly one of the windows slammed shut and I didn't think too much of it at first because he had the kind of windows that like slide up and down and it was a fairly old house so I was like oh this probably happens so the window slammed and then I noticed this weird smell just suddenly starting from nowhere and it was totally the smell of urine I was like what and then the dog started barking his head off and I was like okay <laughs> something weird is happening I'm leaving now so I left there were a number of weird things that happened in the house but that thing was like Oh my God! I'm in Amityville or or something. <laughs> Have you guys ever had anything happen to you that you couldn't quite explain, like Pete's story? Yeah, I had something. This also sounds like a Ramsey Campbell story. Yeah. I was in uh, my furnished basement, watching TV. Got up from the couch, and as I was walking away, I saw this big black spider about the size of your thumb crawling on the ground. So I, I got to kill this thing. So I pick up, uh, I think uh, one of my sneakers was on the ground there, so I just slammed it like James Bond and Dr. No. Mm -hmm. And when I left, I expected to see this crushed spider. I suddenly see a whole horde of little spiders. Oh, yep. <laughs> Like it all became a brood somehow. Mommy carrying them on her back, and all yeah. she did is blow the bomb up. Yes. Wow. Could, could have been something like that. Well, whatever. Then I just had to kill all of them. I kept kidding them like men. Yeah, I, I, wow. I, believe, I, I believe mothers can carry multitudes on their back and do. And one of the things you shouldn't do is kill one of them because all you do is literally blow things up and the babies go everywhere. Yeah. Or, or it could have been like that city, that um, story by Clive Barker in the hills, the cities. Yeah. And all, and all the little spiders were were holding on to each other to form one big spider so as to be more formidable. Yeah, that's what I thought when it happened. <laughs> but, then, you know, but then I was trying to think of maybe there was a scientific explanation like Joe uh, Gustafson. Yeah, that, that sounds like the most likely uh, scenario. 
but uh, I'm just saying there was there was no evidence of a corpse of a you know a big that's, spider anywhere. That's a funny thing, no crushed spider, but just the babies. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. That's, yeah, that's not an experience I would want. I'm not big on spiders either. Wow. Anybody else? I only have one creepy story, but it did not occur in Halloween. And and I was sitting reading once in this house I lived in and had no pets, none, not even a fish. And no one was home but me. There was no radios on, no TVs on, nothing. There was, you know, the refrigerator was on in the kitchen and... I was sitting in a chair by a light reading, and upstairs, when you walked around upstairs, oh, there were a lot of loose floorboards, so you could hear people walking, and I could hear footsteps up and down the hallway, in and out of one of the bedrooms, and I was at home alone. Hmm. It freaked the shit out of me. I set the book down. I took, what, four steps into the foyer. I grabbed my wallet, my car keys <laughs> from the end table by the front door, and I left. <laughs> I didn't even go looking around. I mean, there were two locked back doors, um, and... You know, nobody could have broke in without... So I went over to Buddy's house and got my buddy, and he came back with his shotgun, and we walked around, and everything was locked up tight, and nobody was there, and nothing was missing. Yeah, but that's the thing when you don't know. Yeah, it's yeah I, I mean, it's, it's like... You know, I remember the girl I lived with at the time. She could be upstairs. If, you know, she got up and walked from the bedroom to the bathroom, you would hear the footsteps, you know. And there was somebody walking up there, but there was no way in the house, you know. Um, uh, that was bothersome. Scott and I uh, could tell we could we could do a whole show just talking about things that he and I and my sister witnessed at this one house we all three of us lived in at different times uh, in, uh, on Cottage Street in Westboro, Massachusetts, and we had so many different uh, encounters or situations there. The three of us encountered so many strange things there. Like I said, it could be a whole show in itself, just the things that. Mm. Happened there. But I'll tell you something. Yeah, the thing is, is that's the only odd thing like that that ever happened to me. It's yeah, it's funny. Sometimes people, I think everybody has one, at least one occurrence that is unexplainable, you know. And then other people, sometimes they have tons of them, you know. Yeah. Yeah, like me, them. I just I have only one. That's a. Yeah. Oh my I god, I couldn't even remember all the stuff that happened at this cottage tree house. I'll just tell you three things very briefly because they're connected to my son. My son Colin is autistic, and so. Um, <clears throat> They all happened kind of in, 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 around the same time. Um, uh, one, it was the one-year anniversary of my father's passing, and nobody had said that to my son. He, he was—I uh, I can't remember how old he was at the time, but he was—he was young and, and he's autistic. Nobody had mentioned to him this is the one—the one-year anniversary of your, of your grandfather's passing. So Colin and I are sitting, looking at the computer. He's standing to my left. To my right is a is a bedroom that we don't use except it's used for storage, so it's black. It's dark. So uh, I'm showing Colin something on the computer. Suddenly he looks past me into this doorway and he goes, Grandpa! Like in a voice of recognition, like he just saw my father. And I instantly got goose flush and I looked in that room and of course there's nothing there. But it's the one year anniversary my father passed away. And I hear my son say this in a voice of recognition. It was mm. it was creepy. Mm. Around the same time this happened, um, one day my son and I are walking uptown, uh, and I've got stuck in my head the song from A Nightmare on Christ uh, Before Christmas, 
uh, this is Halloween, this is Halloween, you know? <laughs> and I know I'm not singing it, it's, but it's, it's one of those earworms that's stuck in my head. We're walking side by side. Suddenly he turns to me, he looks at me, and he goes, it's not Halloween. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, know I, I know I wasn't singing out, out loud. And then, again, around the same time period, um, I'm waiting for my son to come home from school, and I'm looking at pictures of my fiance on the computer, and they're sexy pictures. And um, I hear his the, the, the van pull up out front. Now, there's Venetian blinds. There's no way you can see into the house. I hear the van pull up. I drop. I minimize the window. So there's no way he could he could have seen that I was what I was looking at. So I go to, to go to meet him. He, I bring him into the house. Well, he's autistic. He says funny things. He goes, "Put some clothes on, you crazy bitch." <laughs> and I said, "Colin, what are you saying? Who are you talking about?" And he says, "Hong." That's that was my my fiance's name. Like Hong, you know. It's like, ha, he, there's no way he could have seen through the Venetian blinds to see what was on my computer screen. Hmm. So it was these three strange incidents that seemed to involve precognition. And I'm not saying I, I embrace that stuff readily, but it was just weird. These, these three things happened around the same time period involving my son. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it makes me think of that movie with um, Kevin Bacon. Oh, um, what was that called? Richard Matheson's story. Yeah, I think so. Um, oh, that was a good movie, too. Yeah, it was. I've seen it several times. It came out in the late 90s. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't remember. Stir of Echoes? Sorry? Stir of Echoes? Stir of Echoes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think that's a really good movie. Yeah, it is. Hmm. Yeah, well, Kevin Bacon's got a kid in the movie who he kind of finds out is has got some sort of ESP ability or can see the dead. Uh, stuff like that. So that's why it reminded me of that. Yeah. That's strange. Yeah, funny how some people have a lot of those and some people have next to none. Mm -hmm. I have a few. They're kind of some of them are kind of benign. You know, my grandmother used to work at this place called the General Lafayette Inn, which was a, a, a old house that had been converted into a restaurant. It was supposedly haunted by General Lafayette. And uh, I was at her. I was not at the restaurant. I was at her house, and she was talking about it. And you know, we were laughing that you know that you know, it was haunted. And just then, the mirror that had hung on the wall for my entire life decided to slide down the wall. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a whole hell of a lot, right? Just, yeah, the, the, the nail just rotted through right at that time. Um, there was, and this is just silly in retrospect, but I, I, came, I came home from high school and walked into the house and sitting there in the living room, and I can hear voices, mm. and I was, and it's like, but I can't understand what they're saying. So I just, it's like I did, it, I did exactly what Joe did. I grabbed my wallet, I grabbed my keys, and I walked out of the house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I honestly thought it was, it had to be a burglar, even though in that five seconds, ten seconds, whatever went, it's absolutely impossible because I was sitting in the living room in a chair. And there's a hall, living room, dining room, hallway, back door to the kitchen. To, to come into the house, you would have had to been right in my line of sight. And so, then yeah. you would have had to come halfway to me to get to the stairway to go upstairs. So it just, you know, like I said, a couple of blocks. I had a buddy. He was a hunter. You know, We'll come back with a shotgun, you know. We'll find out what the hell that was. Well, um, have you, any of you ever been asleep in the middle of the night, you woke up in the middle of the night, and you hear a noise, the noise wakes you up, and you're like, I should check that out. There could be somebody in the house. And the other half of you is going, oh, screw that, go back to sleep. You don't want to find out if someone is here. Yeah. So, so finishing up that, that first story... 
Yeah. You know, my mother finds me just standing in the driveway when she comes home. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And in retrospect, I think it was the the, the um we had a, a radiators in the house that were run off of hot water. Oh um, yeah, those things get noisy. Mm. Yeah. So, but you know, at the time it was weird. But the the weird thing is that after my uncle died, um, we started talking about how he, we we thought he haunted our house. We, people would be like wake up in the middle of the night and hear somebody going to the the bathroom, you know, going into the door and, and shutting the door, and then turning on the light. And you would sit there and you would wait and wait and wait and wait for them to leave, and they never would. And the next morning we would wake up and it's like, well, you spent like two hours in the bathroom, and. Somebody else would say, well, no, we thought you were in the bathroom. It's like nobody would own up to it. And this went on for years. Oh, wow. Um, mm. But the most tangible thing that ever happened to me, and, and this is much later when I was in my, in my 20s, we had um, there's a, on the campus of my college there was a botanical garden. And there was this, um, we called it, there was this you know, small building that you could hang out at. And we would, you know, sneak into the garden at night and hang out there. But there were like three or four different ways to get there. And, um, you know, so we all, oh, we're going to meet there at midnight. So I take one way. and I get there and, like, for, everybody's beating me there for some reason. I just don't know how they got there. And they're like, you left early and how did you get here? And I said, what do you mean? I took the, the bridge to the sulfur swamp. And they're like, no, you didn't. I'm like, yeah, I did. I crossed the bridge over the, the swamp. And you're like, no, the bridge is out. Oh. And like, no, it's not. I just came across it. And we walk back. It's only like 100 yards back. And yeah, all the, all the boards are torn out of the bridge. Oh, I have no idea how I got across that swamp. And wow. My shoes That's are a really good story. Yeah. I you know. It's just, yeah. And, and yeah, you know, it's college, so there was some stuff involved. But, you know... <laughs> Yeah, but stuff involved doesn't count, Pete. Okay. I, there, I was understand. Once, there was once I was at some people's house, and they lived, I don't know, like five miles from where I lived. And, of course, back in the day, and so walked. And I got about halfway home, and I had half a joint, and I smoked set in the park because I cut through the park to make the walk quicker. And I smoked half a joint. And I just sat there a bit. And I got up and I started walking down the hill. And it was, I don't know, early summer. And in the center of the park was a small pond. Um, I mean, not small, small. Several, a couple of acres. And it was all manicured, all nice, you know. Uh, there was a walkway around it. Um, there was a fountain out in the middle of it. Um, you could see the whole thing. Um, and it was all misted over, which was really odd because there was no reason for it to be misted. And as I was walking down the hill to get to the path to cut around, all of a sudden I could hear a lot of splashing and two women's voices, and they were laughing, and I couldn't tell, talking a little bit, but I couldn't tell what they were saying, but a lot of splashing and a lot of laughing, and I looked out, and I couldn't see anything, because the pond was like misted over, even though all the surrounding area, there's no mist, and I walked around that whole damn pond while this splashing and laughing occurred, oh, and nothing. Wow. But I would swear that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't some acoustical trick where it was coming out of the woods. Um, it was a very warm summer evening, and it had been that kind of warmth for at least a week. It was absolute, and it was, you know, the it was, was far enough into the summer where the pond was warm. You know, it wasn't an atmospheric thing where... You know, the water was super cold and the air was super warm. There's absolutely no reason for it to be misted over, um, at least that I know of. Um, 
that was a little spooky. Uh, but I did. I did a complete once around the pond trying to... And, and, you know, like I said, the splashing and the laughter kept on going. And there was no, the other thing, too, is even if, even if the, it had been coming from the woods around, you know, this, this pond, well, there was no other water other than the pond itself. I mean, you know, in any, if you step off the path to head towards anything, um, everything, all the woods were 50, 60, or more feet away from the pond, and there was no water anywhere. So the splashing was, I think, what really made it creepy, because I kept trying to say, well, you're just hearing the laugh, and it's echoing out of the woods or something. Um, but it sounded like people swimming and flinging in the water. It was it was really odd. Wow. Um, well, guys, I gotta go. Um, thanks for being on the show tonight. We had a lot of glitches. I don't have to look at the recording, to make sure it worked. Mm -hmm. but. Sorry. No, no. It, it's Google Hangout being moody. So get it all checked out before tomorrow and make sure uh, the show tomorrow will be okay. So. Well, thanks for having us, Mike. Anyway. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks. Happy Halloween. Thanks. I guess it's not Halloween for uh, Salome and Joe anymore. But. No, not for uh, almost five hours now. So, where's Salome at? Where are you at? I'm in Spain. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. Do they have Halloween in Spain? There is apparently Halloween in Spain and England. You guys asked me this the other day when we were talking, and uh, yeah, I've been hearing about trick or treating and stuff, but apparently they don't have the whole concept down yet. <laughs> <laughs> they just have the give me candy part. <laughs> the important part. Yeah. Well, they, they, but Halloween is is not really celebrated here. Um, you know, we did not have many trick or treaters at all. Um, th that's still something really, really new and just hasn't hit here yet. Well, thanks, guys. I got to run. Oh, we're gonna hang around if you want. Oh. Good night, Mike. Okay.